section series. My name is Dr. Sajjo Saniel. I'm the professor and department chair of anatomical sciences. And the camera person is Ms. Selvi Krishnan. <laughs> so what I'm holding in front of you is a dissected specimen of the anterior chest wall from a cadaver. So let's quickly identify the parts and then I shall mention a few salient points about each of them. What we see here is the sternum or the breastbone. So henceforth we shall use the word sternum. The best way to see the sternum is from the inner surface. We see that it's got three parts. This upper part, this is the manubrium sterni. This is the manubrium. We are seeing it from the inner surface now. The larger portion is the sternum proper, the body of the sternum. And this has got four components which have fused together. They, each individual component is known as a sterni bra. So therefore, the body of the sternum is composed of four sterni brae. And the last part here that you see here is the ziphy sternum or the ziphoid process, which you can feel at your, in, the, in your epigastrium. So therefore, this junction between the manubrium and the body of the sternum is called the manubrio-sternal angle of Louis. And that you can see on the anterior surface here. I should tell a few more points a little later. Likewise, the junction between the body of the sternum and the ziphoid process, this is the ziphy sternal joint. Okay, so having mentioned these, now let's come back to the anterior surface. We see that the manubrium sternum articulates with these two bones here. These are the clavicles. So therefore, this is the sternoclavicular joint that you see here. Just under the sternoclavicular joint, we see the first rib, which is articulating with the manubrium sternum. This articulation is a synchondrosis, the synchondrosis of the first rib, and this does not allow any movement. In contrast, the other articulations, other sternocostal articulations are synovial joints, and they allow a limited movement. But anyway, let's come back to this. So the first rib articulates with the manubrium sterni. Now let's come to the second rib. The second rib is the one which articulates exactly at the manubrium sternal angle of Louis. So therefore, half of the second rib articulates with the manubrium, and the other half of the second rib articulates with the body of the sternum. This is the third rib, fourth rib, fifth rib, sixth rib, seventh rib. As we all know, first two seven ribs are called the true ribs. At this juncture, I need to tell you something more. If you look carefully, you find that the ribs which are attached to the sternum have got two parts, an outer, the lateral portion, and the medial portion. The lateral portion, the medial portion. So what's the difference? The lateral portion of the ribs are bony, and the medial portion are cartilaginous. So it's actually the cartilaginous portion of the ribs which articulate with the sternum. So this is the cartilage of the second rib, the cartilage of the third rib, fourth rib, and so on and so forth. So from the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, up to the seventh rib articulates with the sternum. And the ziphy sternal joint, the seventh rib articulates at the ziphy sternal joint, just like the second rib articulated at the manubrium sternal joint. So this is the cartilage, of, and these are referred to as the costal cartilages. At this juncture, I would like you to notice something. You notice that the axis of the bony part of the rib is in this axis, and the cartilaginous part of the rib is at an angle which is different from the angle of the bony part. And this will play a significant role for us when I come to the muscles. So these are the, so this junction between the rib and the bone and the sternum is called the sternocostal joint. You can come in if you want. And the junction between the bone and the cartilage is known as the costochondral joint. Seventh rib, as I told you, articulates directly with the zippy sternal joint. And the eighth, ninth, and tenth ribs, their costal cartilages articulate directly with the costal cartilage of the seventh rib. And therefore, they refer to as the false ribs. And the junction, the articulation is referred to as the interchondral articulation. This is the costochondral articulation. Okay. Just to bring you up to speed, you can have a look at the same thing from the inner surface. This is the inner surface of the chest wall. You can see the, the bony part, the cartilaginous part. Now that we have mentioned the salient points about the, the skeleton of the chest wall, now let's come to the next aspect namely the muscles. This is going to be a little significant for us. Basically, there are three constant layers of muscle on the chest wall. And we can see them here. And going from outer to inner, the first layer is referred to as the 
external intercostal muscle external intercostal muscle external intercostal muscle the layer just next to the deep to the external intercostal muscle and a little bit of it is visible here under the external intercostal muscle where my probe has gone in these muscles which you can see a little bit here this is the internal intercostal muscle and finally deepest we have another layer which you can see from this side they are the innermost intercostal muscle there are a few other muscles which I shall tell you a little later but let me tell a few salient points about each of these muscles first especially the direction of the fibers and their actions the external intercostal muscle if you take a close look you notice that the direction of fibers go from the rib above to the rib below and they're directed antero inferiorly it's like as if you have put your hands in your pocket so therefore the direction is the hands in the pocket direction that's point number one that's about the external intercostal muscles the external intercostal muscle they do not go right up to the sternum as you can see here they stop short of the sternum so what is there the rest of the place they are covered by a membrane and that membrane is known as the anterior intercostal or the external intercostal membrane so then we come to the internal intercostal if you take a look at the little bit that is visible here the direction of fibers of the internal intercostal is exactly at right angles to the direction of fibers of the external intercostal and therefore the the direction of fibers is described as as if you have crossed your hand in front of your chest and your hand goes to the opposite chest so this is the direction of fibers of the internal intercostal this is the direction of fibers of the external intercostal okay so having mentioned that the next point that I need to tell you about is just like we had the external intercostal muscles stopping short of the sternum here and being replaced by the external intercostal membrane. Similarly, the internal intercostal muscles also do not go right up to the sternum inside. They stop short before the sternum on the inside and here they are replaced by a membrane which is known as the internal intercostal membrane or the posterior intercostal membrane. Uh, sorry, please correction not up to the sternum because this is only the anterior chest wall the ribs are going all the way around like this they go to the vertebra so the internal intercostal muscles they stop short of the vertebra vertebral column and the rest of it is replaced by the internal intercostal membrane or the posterior intercostal membrane there was a mistake on my part i showed the sternum i should have mentioned the vertebra okay having mentioned the direction of fibers i need to tell you one more important point about the internal intercostal muscle since the internal intercostal muscles are present right up to the sternum, they are deficient only in the vertebral region. There are two components of the internal intercostal muscle. One component of the internal intercostal muscle, as you can see a little bit here, is between the bony parts of the ribs. So therefore, that component of the internal intercostal muscle is referred to as the interosseous part. And that portion of the internal intercostal muscle, which is between the cartilaginous portion, that is referred to as the interchondral part. Now, why are we differentiating between the two? Because their mode of actions are different. So let's come, that, that brings me to the next point. What are the actions of these muscles? Let's start with the external intercostal. The direction of fibers, as I said earlier, are from above going obliquely downwards, like hands in the pocket. The direction of fibers of the external intercostal are roughly corresponding parallel to the direction of axis curvature of the rib. Now, this is a fundamental law of mechanics. When the direction of the fibers are roughly parallel to the direction of the curvature of the ribs, the action of the external intercostal is to elevate the ribs. Contrary-wise, the direction of fibers of the internal intercostal, the interosseous part, is at right angles to the direction of the curvature of the ribs. Therefore, the action of the interosseous part of the internal intercostal muscle is to depress the ribs. But wait. The story is not over yet. We mentioned that the internal intercostal has also got an interchondral part. The interchondral part, the direction of fibers, are almost at right angles to the direction of the interosseous part. And they roughly correspond to the axis of the, in, the cartilage. So therefore, the interchondral part of the internal intercostal muscle also help to elevate the ribs. And what about the innermost intercostal? their actions are similar to the internal intercostal. At this juncture, before I proceed to the next topic, 
External intercostal being the layer number one, internal intercostal being the layer number two, and innermost intercostal being the layer number three. Layer number two and three, between the layers two and three, is the neurovascular plane, where all the nerves, vessels, and the arteries and the veins, they run. The intercostal nerves, arteries, and veins. Okay. What are the other muscles? For the other muscles, we should come back to the internal surface again, of the anterior chest wall. If you look closely, you'll see a few slips of muscle fibers going from the sternum obliquely up like this. These are the transversus thoracis muscles. They are present on the anterior chest wall, on the inner surface, close to the sternum. What is not shown in this, what is not visible in this specimen, because this is only the anterior chest wall, but as I told you, the ribs curve like this, and they go to the vertebral column. Near the angles of the ribs, again on the inner surface, we have got another group of muscles, a few slips of muscle fibers, which are referred to as the subcostal muscle. And finally, we have some other muscles, which are also not visible in this specimen, namely the serratus posterior superior, serratus posterior inferior, and levator costorum. So what are the functions of these? The subcostal muscle, the transversus thoracis muscle, they help to depress the rib. Serratus posterior superior elevates the rib. Serratus posterior inferior depresses the rib. Levators costorum elevates the ribs. One more point, but I'll tell you that later. Okay. Since we are on the inner surface of the chest wall, at this juncture, I can show you, look at the direction of the fibers of the innermost intercostal. They are roughly parallel to the internal intercostal, and if you look on the external surface, you will find that they are at right angles to the direction of fibers of the external intercostal. The direction of fibers are at right angles to the external intercostal. What we are seeing here is another layer of membrane which I have not mentioned earlier, and that is the endothoracic fascia, which is going to be our subsequent topic of discussion, but not in this specimen. So the inner surface of the chest wall is lined by a layer of deep fascia, which is referred to as the endothoracic fascia. And after that will come the parietal pleura and all the rest of it covering the lungs. Okay, now let's come to another important point here. Now that we have mentioned the muscles and their actions, I will draw your attention to this vessels here, which are seen on the inner surface, just next to the sternum. So can you see this vessel here? And just next to that, another vessel. Similarly on this side also, we can see a vessel here and a vessel here. These are the internal thoracic or the internal mammary vessels. So the medial one is the internal thoracic vein. The lateral one is the internal thoracic artery. The internal thoracic vein is the medial one, the darker one. The lateral the one is the internal thoracic artery. The internal thoracic artery is a branch of the first part of the subclavian artery which arises from here. And where does the internal thoracic vein drain? It drains into the brachiocephalic vein, the respective brachiocephalic vein. So therefore, the left side will drain into the left brachiocephalic, the right side will drain into the right brachiocephalic. Where, in which plane do these vessels run? The internal thoracic or the internal mammary vessels, they run between the innermost intercostal and the transversus thoracis muscle. They run in this plane. At this point, one point of clinical significance. All of you would have heard about coronary artery bypass grafting. One of the vessels which is used for coronary artery bypass grafting is the internal thoracic artery, internal mammary artery. The surgeons call it internal mammary artery. Okay. This I did not mention to you in the class. I'm mentioning it to you right now. Okay. So, before I conclude, one final point remains. This curvature that you see on the upper surface of the manubrium, this is known as the jugular notch because there's a space here called the suprasternal space of burns, and there is a vessel, a vein here, which is known as the anterior jugular arch, and therefore, jugular venous arch, sorry, and therefore this is known as the jugular notch, but that comes under the topic in the neck. So this, in a nutshell, tells us a few salient points about the anterior chest wall. What we cannot see here are the intercostal vessels, because as I told you, the intercostal vessels, they run between layers two and three. So I'll have to strip off layer three here, in order to show you the intercostal vessels. But what I can tell you is that the majority, the, in, the main intercostal vessel, they run in a costal groove in relation to the lower border of the rib above. So therefore, if this is the first rib, this is the second rib, this is the first intercostal space, if this is the second rib, this is the third rib, this is the second intercostal space, 
So the second intercostal vessels, they will run in relation to the costal groove, and that is the lower border of the rib above. But while they're running, they will give off a collateral branch, which will run in relation to the upper border of the rib below. The anterior intercostal vessels are branches of the internal thoracic artery. Likewise, what is not visible here, the posterior intercostal vessels are mostly branches of the descending thoracic aorta. And it is the posterior intercostal vessels, there are two anterior intercostal vessels for each space, but there's only one posterior intercostal artery, and that's why each posterior intercostal artery gives rise to a collateral branch, which I mentioned just now, and they all anastomose with each other, and they also give rise to posterior branch, cutaneous branch, lateral cutaneous branch, and anterior cutaneous branch. And the anterior cutaneous branches, especially in the space second, third, and fourth, they are called the perforating arteries, and they constitute a very important blood supply to the female breast. Okay, so this more or less concludes a few salient points about the chest wall. Thank you for watching. If there are any questions or comments, put them in the comment section below. Have a nice day. Dr. Sanjay Sanyal signing off.